Good morning, everybody. We'll call the meeting to order. Um, it is October 18th. This is the Planning and Zoning Commission. Just make sure you're in the right room. And uh, oh, it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with that, uh, we'd like to establish a quorum, if we could, please. Mr. Wathers? Here. Ms. Kirkner? Mr. Lester? Here. Mr. Hoff? Here. Mr. Kane? Mr. Smith? Mr. Klosik? Here. Commissioner Wantz? Here. Secretary Eisberg? Here. Mr. Chair, please let the record reflect that five members are present and we do have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next on our agenda is item four, review and approval of the agenda itself. Are there any changes to it this morning? No, there are no changes to the agenda. All right, the chair would be happy to accept the motion that we approve the agenda as presented. I move we approve the agenda. Second. All, right, all in favor? All right. Sounds unanimous. We have an approved agenda. All right, and then we have minutes from September 20th and October 5th. Um, <coughs> Any proposed edits to those? Not be happy to entertain a motion for approval. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. A second. All right, so we have a motion and a second to approve minutes from September 20th and October 5th. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Sounds unanimous. <coughs> All right, we'll move on to item six, commission member reports. I do not have anything to report. Uh, Commissioner? Uh, good morning, just a few quick things. Uh, one of the most important things, I guess, is the fact that uh, we were notified that the county has maintained their AAA bond rating. Ah, congratulations. Uh, we uh, were able to get that during um, the last four years. I guess we got that in 2018. Uh, so it was, it was during this, um, this, this group of commissioners. And uh, we did a little something different this year. We usually go to New York. Uh, this year we brought all of those folks here and let them actually see uh, the good things of Carol. Uh, took them on a tour, uh, wined and dined them at, at lunch and, and dinner, and uh, as a result, we have maintained that AAA. So we're very proud of that, and as most everyone knows, that goes a long way in, in setting the stage for what we do financially here uh, in the county. So uh, bond sale is, I think, in two weeks. That's going to be interesting to see how that goes because, as you all know, the market is uh, – what would you what would you label the market right now? Interesting, I guess. <laughs> Volatile. Yeah. Volatile. Yeah. yeah. I would. Okay. I was just going to go interesting. So. <laughs> anyway, proud of the proud of the team. Uh, Jen Hobbs is our comptroller, uh, and of course, uh, you know the folks um, Jack Lyburn upstairs uh, in economic development, and of course Ted Zaleski in, in management and budget. So uh, very proud of our team, and, and thank you all for for that. Still working on the ag rezoning, right, Linda? We got yes. that coming up. We have a work session. Next week. Next no, week. I'm sorry. The, two weeks. The following two weeks. And then we're going to vote on that. On the third. On the, so uh, we want to get that here to the end, and I think we're in a pretty good place. Uh, I don't think it'll be such a long work session. I think we'll be in, in good in good. I hope not. Yeah, we're going to present to you the public comment that we've received um, and then just a couple outstanding issues that you need to make some decisions on and then we'll right. be done. So hopefully the third, unless anything crazy happens, this will be done. Let's hope there's no crazy. Yes. Uh, Trying to get a lot of things wrapped up here because uh, there's only 47 days left in this administration. Not that anybody's counting. <laughs> uh, but we're trying to get the loose ends, uh, you know, uh, tied before the new... Uh, new group comes in there are a lot of things we'd like to get accomplished yet had a good meeting with MDOT mm -hmm. uh, last week that's our annual transportation meeting where they come in and give their report on the things going across the state uh, and then we we come back and focus on transportation issues here in the county certainly it all has to do with the state highways but as, as you guys know uh, state highways are pretty much in every part of our state or in our county they're also in pretty much every municipality that we have so it's very important to have a good relationship with them uh, Sykesville continues to get that uh, down there that 851 worked on and they're getting to an end there I hope 
uh, and um, we, we, we covered a lot of other things. So uh, great meeting with them, and uh, as a result, we're seeing some good things here in the county as well. Just a, a, a local note, because I, I like to always leave on a local note. Uh, there are so many great things about Carroll County. Uh, yesterday I attended a scholarship uh, luncheon for those donors who give to students that are able to go to Carroll Community College on scholarships. We heard some incredible testimonials from, from kids out there. So kudos to Carroll Community College. And this Wednesday evening, we will be celebrating the 40th anniversary of Carroll County Food Sunday, which is another great uh, organization here in the county. So uh, good things happening in, in the county, as it always is. And uh, thank you guys for serving. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Commissioner. Good stuff. Hey. Um, any other commission members have anything they'd like to add? Yeah, I would just say I, I apologize to Laura and the staff. I said I'd be at the last meeting, and I was not. Uh, I apologize. Um, I, I was sick and totally slept through it. I just <laughs> laid down and closed my eyes. I normally don't nap. I thought it would be a 10-minute thing, and it was a total siesta, so I apologize. <laughs> I wish I had a better excuse, but I don't. <laughs> uh, and I want to thank Janice for chairing the last meeting since I uh, wasn't, able to, wasn't able to make it. Um, Any time. Thank you. Um, with that, we'll move on to item seven, which is the administrative report. Madam Secretary. Hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. This will be a much shorter meeting than our last month's business meeting. Um, so with that, uh, we have some extensions. I'll ask Laura Matthias to update you on those. Good morning. Good morning. All right, we just have one extension this past month. It is S160018 Liberty Road Crossing. Um, this, you may recall this one, this is down uh, 20, in Taylorsville. And it was, this is the fourth extension for this site plan. They have come to us in the meanwhile, and we've held a couple meetings. They, they're looking to go a different direction, perhaps, but they're still deciding. So with that in mind, they just kept the plan approval current, so they did extend it. And this is in Commissioner District 4. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, and then next, Abigail Rogers will update you on uh, Board of Zoning Appeals cases. Good morning. Good morning. So there are two BZAs that were heard on uh, September 27th. K6414, Stairs, Stairs High Valley Farm, was for a conditional use for a farm alcohol producer and banquet facility. And that was on 40 acres at 1742 Hugh Shop Road, Westminster, in the Agriculture Zone Commissioner District 3. The use was approved. K6413, Brown and Brown Companies, was for a conditional use as an outdoor storage facility and vehicle rental on 0 0.7 acres at 2007 Liberty Road, Sykesville, in the C2 District, Commissioner District 5. This was also approved. On October 5th, there was a continuation hearing for Case 6404, Mulligan Recovery Center. This is for the request for expanding a sober living house from eight to 10 beds, and that was at 829 Franklin Avenue, Westminster, District 3, and that use was denied. Uh, currently, we don't have any pending cases. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Abigail. I appreciate it. Um, I have no other items for the administrative update this morning. All right. Thank you. With that, we'll move on to item eight on our agenda, which is a special report involving Progress Way Industrial Park. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. 
Um, Laura Matthias with Development Review, the Bureau of Development Review, and we do have one um, item from our Bureau on the agenda today, which is a special report. And this is, you've never seen one of these before, so <laughs> I will take some time and walk you through it, no problem. Um, so just a little bit of information, and then I will ask these two gentlemen to introduce themselves. So as I said, special report. Um, this is for the subject, I simply called it Progress Way Industrial Park because it is uh, proposed along Progress Way. This is a proposal that is coming from the, the owner developer of these properties, Merit, Merit Properties. Um, so all of these lots that we're looking at are in the I-1 Light Industrial Zoning District. There are six lots, five of them developed, that are within this proposal. And the basics of this proposal is that they are asking you to consider their request for designation as an industrial park. So again, this is, this is a little unique, and when I go through the port, report, you will understand the background of these properties and how they have come before you today, okay? But with that, if you gentlemen would please introduce yourselves. Thank sure. You. Sure. Uh, Stuart Ford with Merritt Properties. I'm a development manager, and I have uh, the Progress Way, Eldersburg, as part of my overview with Merritt Properties. Uh, good morning. My name is Zachary Lett. I'm a licensed landscape architect um, with LPDA, and uh, we have been helping uh, Merritt Properties through this process. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. All right. So I'm going to start with where we are and the existing um, conditions and the history of these parcels. So again, we are down in Eldersburg. Here's Route 32. Uh, Route 26, and I think you're very familiar with this area in here. There's a lot of development activity, things that you've seen recently in the area. The lots, again, are all on Progress Way with access onto Progress Way that we're looking at. I'm going to zoom in here. Okay. So again, there are six lots that they are bringing before us. Five are developed. We have all of them are within a subdivision which was called Eldersburg Business Center. And that was the name of the developer at the point in time. This is not a, a designation related to the development of these sites, but the subdivision was called Eldersburg Business Center. Um, so each of these lots, we have uh, here, lot 2B is this large one. Lot 17 is right here, lot 13, here, lot 10 is undeveloped, lot 9C, and lot 8. Okay, so these are the six lots that are highlighted that are the subject of this um, review today. So again, these were initially recorded in 1989. There have been various uh, consolidations, resubdivisions that have occurred over time since then. There is currently, we are processing, lot 2B is currently being resubdivided. This is the large one. Okay, so there will be one additional lot. And at the same time, between 1990, after that initial subdivision, and 2017, there have been numerous site plans for these properties that have come through our process, been approved by the Planning Commission. So site plans, amended site plans, even lot, uh, the lot that's undeveloped, lot 10, has had a few uh, site plans that have made their way to some extent through the process but have obviously not been realized. It is still a vacant lot. And through all of that, Merit Properties has been on every single one of those site plans that you'll see in your plan packet. Okay, so adjoining this property, we do have properties in the commercial zoning district, that <coughs> front 32. All of the subject lots, again, are accessed off of Progress Way, which right now terminates here. I'm going to go back one slide so you can see what that looks like in the bigger picture, because that does terminate at 
the you're familiar with the Beatty property here. Now there is a plan major street and we are processing a plan for Georgetown Boulevard extended, which does show a connection to Progress Way. So that will be, the, the intent is that that Progress Way will be extended. Just to give you context of the area. And that zoning on the Beatty property where you cross into it is also I-1 that matches the zoning on these properties. All of these lots are in the existing water sewer service area, freedom designated growth area, freedom priority funding area. Okay. So in December of 2019, again, these site plans were developed between 1990 and 2017 for these properties. In December of 2019, with the comprehensive update to the county's business and industrial zoning districts, we have added a definition and a code section for industrial park that was not there pre prior to that <clears throat> code change in 2019. So Merritt Properties has now submitted a proposal that these developed, five developed, one undeveloped properties on Progress Way, they're looking to obtain a designation as an industrial park, to be recognized as an industrial park. So with that, the, myself and the zoning administrator worked together to review their in submittals and we outlined a process for them. And we said, as these are changes to approved site plans that the Planning and Zoning Commission has approved, so your first step is a determination from this Planning Commission as to if it meets the intent of an industrial park as laid out in the code. If so designated by the Planning Commission, they will then need to process a site plan for the Progress Way, whatever we call it, industrial park. Okay, so there will be a site plan that shows all of these properties. It will be reviewed by technical agencies. It will come before you for approval, all right? So I have placed into your plan packet the industrial park portions of the code. So what is an industrial park? What are we looking at? The code states that an industrial park is a self-contained development area of primarily industrial uses that is cohesive with a common development scheme. Landscaping, signs, walkways, and parking will be provided in an integrated and harmonious design. So the code does, most of our code section here in Industrial Park addresses uses. The uses for this are, of course, uses are always subject to change and they will be reviewed as part of the site plan process. So that will be need to be placed onto the site plan, what are your uses, and then it will be reviewed per this code section as to how that qualifies into an industrial park. Okay, so what we're, focused on today, outside of the uses, we have the landscaping, signs, walkways, and parking, right? And we're looking for integrated and harmonious design is how it's stated in the code. So the developed properties were approved as <coughs> warehouses, office warehouse, and a school, and on those site plans which you have in your packet, there's landscaping that was provided per each plan Signage, walkways, and parking, those are existing, except on that one undeveloped lot, right? So here are some photos, some snapshots of what this area looks like. You'll see some trees, the trees, landscaping, screening, um, the buildings, you know, as they were developed as different properties, maybe some of the materials are matching, but in all in all, it was not designed as one development. So now the challenge is how do you make that design meet the intent of the code? So what is proposed, the proposal includes updating the signage throughout all of those lots throughout the area and adding pedestrian walkways. Now again, this will go through a technical review process as to 
you know, if this is feasible, doable, we won't know until we get to that review process, right? But they are proposing with this, you'll see pedestrian connections that are existing as well as proposed. And also signage. So updating the signage throughout um, to create that harmonious, everything is, is, is one industrial park. So again, if designated today by the Planning Commission as an industrial park, they will go through a site plan process and they will be back before you again. So the basics of this are before you today, you can ask questions of the developer if you so choose. And we are looking for a determination today from the Planning Commission to designate these specific lots as indicated in the report and in the content as an industrial park. All right, thank you, Laura. <clears throat> Gentlemen, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, as Laura indicated uh, at the beginning, this is an unusual uh, pathway through this. From, from, the, from our standpoint as a developer, it's um, the underpinnings of us being here today had to do with trying to restore some of our uh, land use um, opportunities to, to lease to things that were uh, not preserved in the 2017 revamping of the zoning. So that's the underpinnings of why we're here, uh, to, to restore those from our standpoint. The only available pathway is to pursue this industrial designation under the current, under the current zoning. So um, it, it, if that's the only available pathway, then that's the pathway that we're, that we're pursuing. Uh, but that is, that's the driver for us, is to kind of get back to where we were from, as Laura indicated, from 1990 to 2017, there were certain land uses that we were allowed to rent to, tenants that we were allowed to have in that park. So uh, we, we've worked with Laura to try and understand the intent of the uh, current designation of industrial park uh, with the comprehensive design and the pathways and the signage. and. And with Zach's help, we've put forth this package. So just that's kind of where we stand. <clears throat> um, well, this is new to us, too. Um, so this is the first time we've taken a look at this definition. Um, well, I guess it's not the first time we've looked at the definition. It's the first time we've applied the definition <laughs> to something. Yeah, it's a, it's a new pathway for, for all of us to, to navigate through. Right, right. So we can work collaboratively here. To That'd be great. Try to, try to uh, do this. Um, it, to me, it seems um, pretty straightforward um, in terms of what you're proposing and how the area is currently used and how what you suggest fits within, I think, the intent of having this designated as um, an industrial park. The definition is full of things you can't do, it seems like, as we go through this. Um, True. And that, I take it, is not a problem as far as how you intend to use, use the property. Yes, I, I, I mean we're. I don't know that's the what you can't do is is the issue so much as as having lost some of the opportunities for certain percentages of ancillary or associated uses. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? On this? No. It's pretty straightforward, I think. I, I would say you know, the, whether there is a permitted use under here, the, you know, additional. Principal uses permitted may include, and there's a list. And, and um, the undeveloped parcel used to be, a, I believe, a, like a paintball uh, sporting. Years ago, it was, it was ten years ago. Yeah, the, the the bigger parcel that had the paintball field on it is uh, it has been developed. Okay. The smaller one uh, just to the west of that was a little bit of a soccer field in the front portion okay. of it. Uh, right. But the, the, the piece that was actually the paintball field has been, has been developed. developed. Okay. Yeah, we developed that. And it was probably a number of years ago. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> I, I, in, in that the, one of the uses that might be permitted, may be permitted, <clears throat> is an outdoor trap skeet rifle archery range. And given the proximity to uh, retail and homes, I'm wondering if there's a way for us to exclude that as a use at this location. At this location and I'm wondering if that would be an issue for you it's not a huge thing to me I'm just thinking through you know what's going on on that road and in that area right 
it's unlikely that we would do that. That's not our core competency of how mm -hmm. we typically develop. Um, mm -hmm. I would never uh, advocate for having something Take taken away. away from our having opportunity that was uh, designated by the comprehensive rezoning to be an applicable use. Mm -hmm. um, so I would, I would, um, am I totally objecting to that? Not necessarily. I just, I, I, you know, from our standpoint, again, not to right. berate it, but we've had uh, things taken away from us in the comprehensive rezoning, and I wouldn't advocate for more of that. But if if that's a stance that uh, that you guys want to take, then we'll have to work through that. Right. That concern, actually, as you work through it, I think it's prohibited. It says, however, the following uses permitted in the commercial districts are prohibited prohibited in an industrial park. Huh. And that's okay. the list that includes the. I apologize. Um, I read that wrong. Yeah. So I think that concern's already taken care of here with that. Uh, that I totally read that wrong. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Prohibited in the in, okay. Yeah, my bad. Yeah, I apologize. So I um, any other questions or comments? I have a question about the lot that was kind of excluded in between. Um, it's part of, part of like being a cohesive unit. Um, is that kind of uh, going to cause any problems? Because number C is kind of off to the left there, and then you have a gap with another lot that's not yours. Typically when you think of the park, it's gotta be, you know, it's all together as one. Does that, I mean, my question is, does that kind of create an incohesiveness <coughs> to your guys' you know, plans? You know, you have one, you have lot C out there, kind of off to the left, you can separate it a little bit. Um, you kind of see that as an issue um, or is there a way around that landscape-wise, I guess? make it seem included with, with that lot you know separating it out yeah I follow what you're saying um, I, again the way that we have come about this over that period of time from 90 to, to 2017 um, and now trying to backwards fit into an industrial park that is just one of the items that is um, less than ideal perhaps <coughs> but uh, I think that the plan that Zach and his team have come up with does the best job that we can given the situation of those lots to to draw them all together as yeah. that owner have you approached that owner to see if they would be uh, we have not inclined okay. we have not. <clears throat> Laura the last question I guess I mean are, are you did you have anything else to add to that no. I apologize I didn't mean to cut you off progress way does it go all the way to the uh, currently does it go all the way to the property line with Beatty is there anything that the county needs so that when that extension of Georgetown th that you do that we desire to have there are there any rights of way that we need as a county to make that happen or is it does it go all the way to the property line that's a, a very good question I would I would need to inspect further into the plat, see what that condition is there right now and, and what we have. And that would be part of the site plan process to make sure that that there is what is needed in order to continue Thank you. the street. To my knowledge, at the end of that cul-de-sac, we do not own, as a private entity, a parcel between the end of that cul-de-sac and the Beatty property. I believe that's all the counties. And if it's not, we would certainly not have any issue surrendering that as it's a logical flow through great and i assume that really if we designate this as an industrial park that doesn't inhibit that further conversation or analysis Correct. that can be dealt with later we appreciate that well if there are no other questions i'd be happy to entertain a motion that we approve this designation as an industrial park i'll make the motion that we approve this as an industrial park Motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Do we need a roll call or can we just? No, I just think a regular vote, voice vote is fine. All right. So we have a motion and a second that this uh, be designated as an industrial park. <coughs> is there any further discussion? All right. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstaining? Sounds unanimous. Right. With the record, thank you very much. We're in favor, and the motion thank you. carries. There we go. Thanks for your time. Consideration. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Barb.
move on to, uh, you know, I, once again, I refuse, I forgot to ask about public comment. So let me, is there anybody here that wants to comment on this? I don't know that we have. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, move on to item nine, zoning definitions and zoning districts explainer overview. Yeah, so this is new-ish. Um, it's something that staff have been working on with the implementation um, of the code revisions. And one of the things that the commissioners had requested was um, a more layperson's interpretation of the zoning code. This by no means, and we say it a million times, replaces the legality of the zoning code. But it just helps um, <clears throat> those that, um, you know, I mean, it, look, it's a legal document. It, it requires legal interpretation. Um, so codes are not meant to be inherently easy because it's your code of law. So what we've tried to do is kind of, again, make it more in the layperson's terms of how to explain how these definitions are, what some of the um, uh, requirements are, and how they would play out on the ground. So Tiffany and Abigail have been working on that to um, simplify things and to really illustrate <clears throat> what the code would look like. So with that, I'm going to turn it over th to them to uh, give you a brief presentation. And our intent is this is an introduction and an overview. Um, <clears throat> this, again, was something that commissioners had recommended. So we will complete it once the code of the conservation and agriculture are, are adopted um, because there's still some changes that may need to be made as a result of that. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to them to present to you. Hello. Good morning. See you this. Okay. So yeah, that was a pretty good introduction. <laughs> um, so the county has worked on the updates to chapter 158, uh, the zoning regulations, to ensure consistency with the newly adopted plans. And this has been a multi-year effort. And as Linda said, this is just sort of our overview of how we are going to communicate to the public sort of what, what's going on and what these terms are. So we're going to start out with the one of the projects that I worked on, which is the zoning definition explainer. Uh, that's the uh, part it's for Chapter 158, and it's to ensure consistency with the new plans. Um, Let's see. So this was really just a layperson's guide. Um, it's an illustrated guide to zoning definitions. Uh, it's intended to accompany the codified definitions. It's informal, and it's for citizens to explore in kind of one place in one document. And of course, it's not all the terms that are relevant in the code, but it's ones that often people have questions about and um, aren't super intuitive if you just look at the words. And the terms we've done alphabetically, so it'll be easier for people to search for. Actually, we've kind of called this the glossary before. So the goal is to inform residents and commission members on the meaning of planning and zoning terms. And we're doing this now because of the uh, completion of uh, code revisions. And as Linda said, the definitions are not legally binding. So this isn't everything, but the general um, sort of categories that the terms fall into is stuff like lots, bulk requirements, residential areas, agricultural land, transportation, ADUs, that was talked a lot when we were updating the uh, conservation and agricultural zoning, and other relevant technical terms. So mostly it's technical terms that might need more explaining. So this is sort of a uh, just diagram of what each of the pages looks like. So first you have the title, you know, what is a building? And we give at the top a code definition, which is the official legal language. It is legally binding, it's what's in the code. But then under there's explanation, which is the layperson's terms. So it, this is not legal terminology, it's not legally binding, but it's sort of like how you'd explain it to a friend. And this is an example of one of the pages. So everything's alphabetical, and we put two terms per page. So um, we also kind of formatted it so it would be easy to print out if people wanted to like print out a particular page to bring to meetings or reference. And uh, in this example, we have frontage in grade planes. We start out with what they are for a grade plane, 
land derived from the reduction of lot sizes when clustering pursuant to chapter 157, which is of course like the very kind of dense language. And we have a diagram I made. Some of the definitions just have photos, but a lot of them have graphics that I actually made to try to illustrate these uh, concepts. And then at the bottom you have the explanation. Hi. Are there any questions regarding that portion? Yeah? No, it okay. looks good. Awesome. Yeah, Great job, Abigail. And I'm Tiffany Fawcett, um, Comp Planning Technician and Department of Planning, and I will go over the Citizen's Guide to Carroll County Zoning Districts now. All right. I'm going to reach <laughs> <laughs> over. Holy mouse. It really is. Um, so staff has created a citizen's guide to Carroll County zoning districts as a companion to the zoning definitions to help with a layperson's interpretation. Um, whereas the zoning definitions came at, about from since 2019, they've been in discussion. The the guide itself really came out of discussions in, with in the process of the zoning text amendments over the last year or so um, to try to alleviate some of the confusion or make um, planning and zoning even a little more approachable to the average citizen, um, which is really a goal, uh, hopefully, for a future here. Um, oh, go back. That's okay. <laughs> So um, in the guide, it follows the code with each district being broken into four at-a-glance snapshots for quick reference. Those snapshots are purpose, permitted use, conditional uses, and bulk requirements. So each district should be broken up in, those, in that way. And we'll just give an example here. Next slide, please. Thank you. So first is the purpose of each district, and in this case, you use the R20,000 residence district as an example as we'll go through them. Um, on the left-hand side is the purpose as taken from the code, and then on the right-hand side is land zoned in that district at a glance unofficial map. Next slide, please. Thank you. And then on the next, um, the next page is the permitted uses. On the left-hand side, a permitted uses is explained. Then that's broken into what a principal use is, what an accessory use is, and what a non-conforming use is. And then on the right-hand side is a table showing, in this case, the district of our 20,000 residence districts, typical permitted uses as they are in principal uses, accessory uses listed alphabetically, and then underneath is where it is where it is in the code as reference and the left hand side is as linda had pointed out we do have disclaimers showing that this is not official and to please contact uh, the the zoning administrator or to further look at the code for descriptions on that next slide please thank you and then the next page is the conditional uses of each district um, on the left hand side it explains that the conditional use is requires the approval of the Carroll County Board of Zoning Appeals and then gives a brief description of what the Board of Zoning Appeals does. And on the right hand side again is a table for in this case the R20,000 residence district of conditional uses listed alphabetically and hopefully, um, hopefully in terms that are um, Although they are taken from the code, used where it's like where it's bar versus tavern, they're put together in alphabetical order and together under bar because it just seems more common to, for a citizen to use that or person to use that. Again, code for reference down here and disclaimer on the left-hand side. Next slide, please. <coughs> and on the final um, page of each district should be the bulk requirements. Um, hopefully interpreted um, a little easier to understand in images here uh, and broken into a table that for the ag conservation and our and residential districts um, have the typical require lot requirements for a dwelling commercial and industrial uh, look a little different because they're building not dwelling mm -hmm. um, and then on the top right typically there'll be a note in this case um, it, it'll say why it might not look like this. This is how it actually came out of it. When you know the R20,000 district isn't necessarily one house per 20,000 uh, square feet. And so this kind of explains that clustering could make that look different in that district. Um, and so there'll be typical notes just going through it why it might not look uh, exactly as this, this image shows. And then the, um, the other uses that are permitted and their uh, bulk requirements are in a table here on the left with the code being referenced on the bottom and the disclaimer again. Like 
<coughs> and that is our introduction to the zoning definitions and the zoning district explainers. Um, next, we will be uh, finalizing this because we do have the um, ag and conservation updates that we'll need to make if there are any. And then we will come again before you with more than uh, just the introduction. It'll be more in-depth explanation and view of what we have. Then we will present it to the county commissioners. Then we'll make it available to citizens and everyone else online. Any questions? So this seems um, extraordinarily helpful. I think this is fantastic. Yeah. Um, it really is. And while it might put people like Jim and me out of business, you know, <laughs> this kind of stuff can't, can't go on. But uh, I think it is, it is really helpful. The one question I have is, do we define bulk requirements anywhere? That term, I've been almost 10 years on this commission, and I still have to stop and think, what are bulk requirements? Because that definition, it, it doesn't sound like what it is to me. No. Sounds like you know how much know. area is in a drum or something. <laughs> yeah, you have bulk requirements in your definitions, yeah, I'm right? Yeah, sure, I do. Mm -hmm. I, I, but I don't know if it's an official definition. It, 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 it is well, official. I think Abigail. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. 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 Okay. okay. I know she had, but I wasn't sure if it was official. So yeah. yeah I might have missed that. Okay. Well, good. That is That's an excellent perfect. point, and I think we'll <laughs> add it to that uh, particular page of bulk okay. requirements. <laughs> yeah, what just what it are. is, you know, because it really Absolutely. setbacks and stuff. But Absolutely. it just the name has always took me about three years to figure that out. So if you can scroll up for a second, I just want to, I know it's kind of cheesy, but like some really great stuff. If you know, go down one more. Oh, I apologize. Yep, that so was the, the wrong the button. Slide completely. 13. Slide 15. 13, 13. 13. So I think what was really nice that was done, um, and this is really, I mean, this is the brainchild of these two uh, ladies. They did an incredible job, but they color coded too. So it's, it's very terrific. easy to use. Everything is color coded. R20 is the yellow and matches the map color. It's highlighted on each page within the table, you know, A, B, C, D, E, and mm -hmm. F are the same colors as what they represent on the left hand side is on the right hand side. Again, making it very easy to use. It's a consistent theme throughout. So I think that really, again, makes it so helpful for someone um, looking up this information, trying to understand it. I yeah. agree. Totally agree. It's, yeah, the, it's the details. And I, and I think they, they did a really wonderful job Absolutely. getting those uh, across. And if you're a visual learner, the colors and the consistency, I think yep. that's just fabulous. No, I, seriously, I think it's an extraordinary bit of work. I hope we can get a copy of, or we can have access yeah, to it. Yeah, she will. We can use it. Everybody but us. <laughs> yeah. No, you won't. I think it'll be great for our new, we have a lot of new members. Um, we'll have a new board, and this will be very helpful for them to Absolutely. really, uh, you know, hit the ground running with these concepts because they're not easy um, and they're not really meant to be easy, but we're trying to make it a little more um, user friendly. <laughs> no, I think this is, you know, zoning is inherently difficult, not because it, we try to make it difficult, but just because it is, it's complicated and then it's entangled with so many other concepts. So um, this really is, I think we want our, we want uh, layman to be able to utilize this and understand it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, um, thank you so much. I think they did an excellent job. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Well done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I think it's a great resource for us too. Yes. So. Absolutely. I plan on using it. All right. Uh, so that was item nine. So we'll move on to item ten, which is water and sewer fall amendment, and this is an introduction for us. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Getting there. All right, so this is the introduction to the our fall amendment cycle. And Commissioner Wentz, this is your last introduction. <laughs> <laughs> So, as a PC member and actually as a Board of County <laughs> Commission member. So, we have uh, multiple amendments that have come across this cycle. Oops, sorry. So, we have MAP amendments, uh, mainly in the Freedom Area for water and sewer, Hampstead and Manchester, and then the City of Westminster has a uh, amendment for their water chapter. So, the MAP amendments for the Freedom Sewer Service Area. Some of these will probably look familiar. This is, uh, we call it internally, it's the stock, Smith Stockdale property uh, right across from Liberty Exchange. Uh, this is the uh, St. John's properties that they are looking to bring into the sewer service area. 
the total demand for this calculated is 8,400 gallons for all four properties. So their, their request is to be brought into from Long Range into the priority sewer service area for their proposed plans and update that they're having on that property. These properties are right below Cleese Mill at the corner of Cleese Mill and Liberty Road. These are all these are the Tevis uh, real estate properties. Three of the, actually I believe two of the th four properties are currently developed. One has a restaurant, one has, I believe is a building that has been redone, but to my knowledge, there's, at least in the front side, there's nobody in there yet. Uh, they, the developers come to us, or actually the engineer, and they would like to and bring these properties into the sewer, water and sewer service area, actually I'm sorry, sewer service area, because their well, their current septic is beginning to fail. They have looked at the parcel, which is right, this big parcel, to see if they're able to get perks to expand, extend their, their septic. They're not getting favorable perks. So in order for them to continue moving forward with business, they requested to be brought into the uh, actual sewer service area. Now, the demand for this is based on what is actually on the ground today. Um, so, and what could potentially be on the ground in the future should uh, the restaurants and other things move forward. So they're asking for 5,600 gallons to be for their demand. Um, this property, obviously, as you see, this is the Liberty, I'm sorry, not Liberty, this is uh, Long Reach Farms, Lot 23, which was brought in to the sewer service area, <laughs> I believe two cycles ago. And at this time, the thought is, to tie into this and then move forward. But obviously if, if these properties get brought in and the tie in, this property has not been developed yet, the engineer will have to figure out how to get the sewer lines and where they need to go to get them to tie into the actual, the sewer service area itself. Um, in the package you will receive once we get to the point of planning commission to certify, there is more in-depth information about this property and what they requested in so you get a better idea of what they're they're looking for. The property show you see here uh, is both water and sewer. This was actually a emergency connect. This property had a failing septic and they actually had to, I believe it was twice a month, have a service come out and pump their septic. So they actually have already connected to both sewer and since they were, they were, they talked to us and I talked to utilities and, they, and since they were already, already gonna have the, the hole open, they wanted to connect to water as well. So they connected to sewer and they've connected to water. Uh, the sewer was an emergency aspect since their septic had pretty much failed and they were spending a lot of money having it pumped at least twice a month, if not more. So they have already gone ahead and connected we talked with the health department and MDE, and they were fine <coughs> with them connecting, and then we do the amendment after the fact. Where is that property? This property is right off Linton Road, um, which, and for a little bit further south, uh, is, you got 26 down here, so that property is near the whole Eldersburg Exchange in that area of, of the of the county so and as you can see the line actually does run right in front of their property and it so it made sense and they were fine with you know understanding they'd have to pay for everything to be tied in but that was is either that or keep on having their, their septic pumped out so again since they were already open they chose to go ahead and connect to the water aspect so that's why we're showing them and we you know we put them in the water again 250 gallons is the is the nominal average of what the state asks us to do but as for what this is this will not change the table at all uh, the previous two as you'll see later on uh, there is not a table 32 update because those numbers actually are included in the zable property when we did that originally did those water and sewer calculations or in this case the sewer calculations they were based on a higher density when those properties did uh, get redone the <coughs> density was brought down so we had excess demand estimated demand so that prop those demands now are we're able to use in other areas that have been have requested uh, but on the flip side 
we still have the 20% reserve for those properties that are currently on septic should their septics fail and they have the ability to tie in, then we have that reserve there. So we're not taking from those who are in long range who may need to come in at some point in time. So it's, we have excess that we're able to maneuver. This is for the uh, city of Westminster. As you may know, uh, they had a pilot program for a uh, water reuse facility. That program has, the pilot program has been going well. So this is for them to actually update their whole chapter um, with all the new numbers based on the pilot program. And the table will provide 500,000 gallons in priority for water and 500,000 gallons in future for water. So they're having an additional 1 million gallons that with this, through this water reuse program that they're able to utilize. And this, this is the town of Manchester. These are more, even though the table is being updated, these are actually more of map updates. These pro this property right here, if I get my mouse to work, and this property as well as this property, the two that are shown as long range now were previously shown as existing. They are not connected and there are no plans for them to connect as well as I believe both of them, if not one of them, is outside the town limits and the town does not serve outside their limits with the exception of this property right here, which is, I believe is Vincent Seafood. They are currently being served. They were previously shown as long range. We're just making it now. The, the town came to us and asked, can we make them show an existing since they are currently being served? And their actual usage is being uh, caught, brought into the table as existing use. So there is no change in that aspect. However, the table, when it comes to water, there is roughly a reduction of just shy of a thousand gallons. And you'll see, I'll show that in a minute with this property and this property coming out that they are now reducing their estimated demand by a thousand gallons in the other category. <clears throat> Finally, Hampstead, this is the Lizzie lockers, Lizzie's lockers on Hanover Pike. They are asking, they're currently in the existing for water, even though they have not connected yet. And they are in future for sewer. They're asking to be brought into priority, just moved to priority for, for sewer. They currently, I believe, don't have a, a bathroom facility, or if they do, it's, you know, it's maybe it's like a Porta John or something like that. They are going to build a bathroom facility, so they're looking to just connect for that one facility. This will be, it won't even move the needle when it comes to water and sewer um, on the, in the tables. So they're asking for them to come in so they can actually bring their build that small bathroom for their the people on site. And then finally, this is the uh, formerly Solo Cup, now the, the Pingo Random House in Hampstead. They are currently on sewer. Uh, but however, they are looking to get annexed in at some point in time. And in talking with the town, we decided to go ahead and request to make the request for them to be brought into the water service area. The usage is based on the sewer. If you do the multiplier, 800 gallons for industrial property times, the there's roughly 52 acres, you get a lot of usage. Um, they, I've been looking at it for sewer, they've been averaging 500 gallons a day for sewer for the last five years, because it's, been, it's mainly a warehouse and they have you know, toilets for the employees, but they don't use that much. So we utilize this and as you'll see in table 15, uh, the two footnote to the bottom. So for Westminster, that defines, it's, you know, it's, it's the water reuse facility. So zero to six is including the 500,000 gallons. And then again, in the future, 500,000 gallons. As you may you see, if you, if you go back and compare this table with the previous one, the, um, the numbers in the other for or in the, the capacity aspect are exactly the same. The reason that is, there was another project that had the exact same usage or same capacity, 500 and 500, that was still being shown. However, that project is no longer being, this project is taking that in that place. So the numbers stay the same, but this project <laughs> is now super, or is taking that over. 
And finally, uh, bullet point 12, and this is coming from the town and, and it makes sense, is with a priority water demand, since it's being based on 500 gallons or average uh, sewer use, should a change of use occur, which it were, would require a greater demand, demand for that, pro that property, then the city or the town and planning staff would have to reevaluate the capacity to see if they actually are able to go up to that 52,000 gallons plus is what that actual number would be. Um, so 500 gallons is, is manageable, <coughs> but if you look at their actual table and their numbers, it would be adding an additional 52,000 could put them in areas where they don't want to be. Uh, just because it's just it, it's extreme usage and of course not knowing what could go in there someday obviously being a warehouse is one thing but should a distillery brewery whatever decide your usage goes way up then so that is our brief uh, introduction so yes we've updated the maps and the water the maps the water and sewer maps uh, the demand calculations for table 15 again in table 32 no calculations were increased or decreased due to the fact that we have excess in there from the Zabel property that we're able to use in other areas. And then, of course, the update to the water, the Westminster water chapter. So tonight, uh, we're going to present to the Town of Manchester Planning Commission for their certification on their portion of this amendment. We will go in front of the City of Westminster this Thursday for their certification, the Planning Commission certification. Again, I will go in front of the town of Hampstead on October 26th for their certification on their portion. We will come back in November to this planning commission to actually ask for the certification that it's, it's, it's consistency with the overall uh, master plan and the, and the water sewer plan. And then we will brief and potentially request that's going to be this the December 8th is set in stone for at least briefing the brand new county commission uh, requesting a public hearing depending on without with the new commission coming in with Mako and all that that the last half of this is going to be fluid um, not really knowing when because without with the new commission all that aspect and if they go to Mako so there's a very good possibility the public hearing could happen in sometime mid late January and then maybe not even until February <laughs> with this is sort of how it works so and we the reason we decided not to brief the current commission is we have to then have a new commission coming in and adopting and we thought it would be best to do it all at once so the new commission can get on board and and that brief that introduction i will do in december will probably be a little more in depth for the new commission just so they have a better better feel of sort of the water and sewer master plan and what the amendments are about that is it. Well, that was very helpful. Thank you. Anybody okay. have any questions? No, but I paid attention and really didn't have to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you lost two I just want to let you all know that. <laughs> you lost five minutes of your life. I did, Chino. Yeah. Just to quiz you later. <laughs> make you feel better. <laughs> I would ask, could, could you email a copy of that table 15 to me? Yes. Um, I, I can't read it from here. Oh, yes. And I'm, not, I'm not quizzing will... you on it, and I know the numbers are right. I just kind of want to look at it. Oh, not a problem. And I will send out, I will finalize the freedom all of the staff reports and so you'll have a big packet that'll come your way um that you'll probably don't want to read it'll help you probably sleep at night um but yes it, it'll you'll get a big packet with all the information in Thank there you. that gives a better insight on where we where the numbers came from and how we got there and, and the additions and tracks and that kind of stuff if I may, just an FYI, so we've had a lot of amendments come forward. That's because we need to do our triennial update. So we are not going to be processing right. a spring amendment. Um, so that way we can catch up and just get the, the, the every three year plan cycle, which is like our reset complete. Um, and, and so what drives our amendments are the municipalities um, taking stuff in, putting stuff out, vice versa. So that's why you see so many of these come forward or capacities freed up because of some type of project that's happened. And so that's why we have these amendments, but their triennial update, which we're required to do every three years is that reset. So we start fresh. Um, so that's why I've had a lot of amendments, especially this particular cycle. Okay. I'm good. Okay. <laughs> good. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, 
And I'm not supposed to ask if there's any public comment, so I didn't, right. didn't miss that. Here, I was all set for it. <laughs> all right, then uh, we'll take, uh, next item is uh, recess. We'll take 10 minutes, does that, yeah, sure. does that work? Yeah. We'll be back about 10 after. Thank you.
wrong. All right, welcome back. <laughs> I think uh, we've saved the best for last here. We have the transportation master plan as item 12. So I will turn that over to you all. Thank you. Um, just up front, I'll say we're going to work through the document that you have. So this is a little bit more of a work session than a presentation. So feel free to interrupt and ask questions. We will readily admit a few of the maps are difficult to read and we are working on some of the clarity issues. Um, so this format you're seeing in front of you may not be the final format and we are open to suggestions about everything. All right. um, this is just as a reminder on the 5th, on October 5th we came before you to just have a brief overview of the entire plan with the different chapters. This is what will be chapter 5. And it is the foundation, we consider one of the really two foundations of the plan, which is the um, consultant study that looked at a number of factors. And I will just briefly, for those of you who didn't see it on the 5th, and just so you know, that presentation as well as the PowerPoint are on our website. We've created, a, I think, a pretty good web page that has all things transportation master plan on it, and we're going to be keeping it updated now that we're moving forward. This will be the first of... Um, we're going to be coming before you, if not at every meeting, as much as time permits, to bring you the different chapters and the different corridors, like these two corridors that we're starting with today, Eldersburg and Finksburg. So um, again, this is just the beginning of our detailed review of Chapter 5, which is called Sub-Area and Corridor Analysis. Um, we had a consultant in 2020 um, study six sub-areas, looking at commercial and residential growth patterns, existing and projected congestion, traffic issues and challenges, possible approaches to the problems, and then finishing off with what he, they called most promising potential improvements. Claire and I are going to be calling those MPPIs because we don't have enough acronyms in planning, so we <laughs> just thought we'd add that. And plus, we have a hard time saying it over and over. So the MPPIs will be the basis of this chapter, and each, each of the quarters will end with that. Um, so just briefly, the consultant used a lot of data from different sources, um, a lot of it from MDOT SHA, from previous studies, not old studies, but the 2018 Maryland 32 study, the 2020 20, uh, Maryland 26 study. Um, they got some of their data from BM, uh, Baltimore Metropolitan Council BMC um, studies, and they got information like commuter flows and demographic projections and they used our future land use from adopted plans as the basis. So they looked at levels of service for both intersection and approaches to intersections. They looked at travel speeds and times. They did not look in much detail at crash data. They've noted it in some of the notes, I believe, but it's not what their analysis was based on. So this isn't really a safety plan. This is really based on capacity improvements, um, although the, obviously the two go together sometimes. Um, and again, with the consultant, we worked out the six um, sub-areas that they were to work on. These are the first two. They're in no order of importance. They're just alphabetical, so we're starting with Eldersburg and moving to Finksburg. Um, just briefly, for all the sub-areas, what they found was that there's countywide and within each sub-area moderate growth in population, employment, and traffic through the year 2040, which is the horizon of this plan. Um, road capacity is generally adequate with some hot spots, and the hot spots will be the focus. Um, major projects are, this is their words, and we agree, no longer the order of the day. They're just not getting done, these multi million dollar projects. So um, the approach was to advocate for strategic improvements and practical design projects, which will gain MDOT's attention. Now, obviously, when you look at the maps that show no build and build scenarios, you don't sometimes see a great deal of improvement. The next chapter that you'll be looking at, chapter six, is our plan major streets, and those are the ultimate build out. So we are including, for instance, the ultimate build out of Maryland 32 in this plan, but this chapter provides some more practical solutions and shorter term within the 20 years. So it's not that we're leaving out the ultimate solutions, it's just that. That's not the focus of this chapter. So I'll just briefly go through for Eldersburg, Sykesville, each of the um, each of the categories that are here. Um, and hopefully, if, if you've had a chance to look at this, um, I believe we sent this on Friday. I know that's not much time, but feel free to interrupt with any questions, and we can hopefully answer them. 
Um, first was a description of the road network, and it's described as Maryland 32, which is a principal arterial for the full length of the sub area. And this, as you all know, provides access south to Howard County and north to Westminster and beyond. Uh, Maryland 26 provides access to the Balt Baltimore metropolitan area. And 97, although not a focus of this, is also in this sub area that runs north south to Howard County and ultimately to Montgomery County and also north to Westminster. And included in this, I believe, are three, yes, those are three recently completed projects. That's just informational. Um, the next section was land use and demographics. What this showed was a low overall growth rate, even though this is our um, growth area. And when I say low, it's relative to um, some of the other areas in the region, but it's relatively low. Um, most employment rate in the area is north of 26, east of 32, um, moderate growth south of 26, and in the area north of 26 in the western part of the Freedom Area, and um, increased traffic generally, since there's not a lot of growth, will primarily be due to traffic coming into and then through the sub area. Um, These maps, the commuter flow, we were really happy to see that they did this. This is something we haven't usually used in our analysis. And I know these maps are hard to read, so we will work on better for the plan. But the commuter flow uh, for this area shows that outgoing, a large portion of Eldersburg residents commute into Howard County, and that's a 21%, and Baltimore County, 33%. Um, incoming, the workers that come into the sub area, 21% of them are already within the sub area and 28% um, come from Baltimore County. And the significance of doing these maps and this analysis is that it's showing <coughs> why you're seeing the, um, the traffic flow on 26 and 32 that you do. I mean, it's, it's probably something anecdotally we know, but it's, it's showing us that. Um, so for local goals and policies, <clears throat> there have been historic deficiencies in access control and the types of growth, and I think they note the residential along Maryland 32, um, that have led to localized, and, and they emphasize localized, congestion that can only be resolved with investments into the secondary road network and access controls. So, so for Maryland 32, although there is a somewhat connected set of streets that provide access between residential neighborhoods, there's disconnectedness in the southeast quadrant of Maryland 32 and Maryland 26. And they also note that full build out is not feasible or affordable. Um, for Maryland 26, this primarily provides access to local destinations they found and serves as the commuting route to Baltimore County, as we just discussed. So for existing traffic conditions, um, First, Maryland 26, and again, that, that was the focus, as you can see, Maryland 26 and Maryland 32. Um, in general, there is moderate intersection delay during peak hours currently, and some reduced speeds as you get closer to the intersection with Maryland 32. Um, travel speeds in the commercial area range from 35 to 44 miles per hour eastbound and 30 to 34 miles per hour westbound. But in the evening, speeds drop below 30 miles per hour for a larger area and as low as 15 miles per hour. The closer you get to Maryland 32, um, which you can see and when I get to the no-build scenario, would be a failing intersection eventually. Um, Maryland 32, there is, along Maryland 32, no level of service D or worse intersections, and that's currently, um, but slower speeds through the center of Eldersburg. And Again, the map here does not show the speeds. It's simply showing the levels of service for the intersection. So they have the, the text that describes their analysis of that. Side street delays are longer than mainline delays, and travel speeds are between 35 and 44 miles per hour through most of the corridor with reduced speeds north of Springfield Avenue and not shown on this map, but again, north of Maryland 26. So the next section is <coughs> planning approaches, I'm sorry. Um, 
so they looked at a number of approaches to some of the defined challenges and again long range plans recognize the need for a four line divided roadway for Maryland 32 and four to six lane divided for Maryland 26 that's the ultimate however Maryland's most recent studies have found this won't be necessary within the planning horizon for this plan um, first these improvements would cost substantially more than making strategic improvements um, the Maryland 32 studies emphasize strategic intersection improvements which include lengthening lanes and managing access and diverting left turn lanes through a more congested intersection to a less congested intersection and we'll get to that in one of our MPPIs um, and Maryland 26 the approach is to prioritize increasing connectivity to arterial roadways to minimize the impact of local traffic on arterial intersections which means motorists from adjoining areas can access des destinations in the corridor without ever having to get onto the arterial road and that is going to be one of the MPPIs which is Dickinson Road which um, was one of the most important things in our freedom plan that we discussed um, okay the next okay um, they provided this map of what the 24 40 conditions would look like with no improvements um, several intersections along 26 will deteriorate Maryland 32 and 26 will reach level of service F in the PM peak Maryland 26 and Georgetown will degrade to D Fallon over on the um, eastern part of 26 will drop to level of service F in both peaks and Maryland 26 and Oakland Mills will drop to level of service E in the AM peak so although not a horrible map that's not something that we would like to see on Maryland 26 um, for Maryland 32 the conditions will worsen only at the Freedom uh, Avenue intersection and obviously they're part of the um, the Maryland 32 26 so the recommended approach um, the recommended approach is prioritizing throughout or throughput I'm sorry uh, along Maryland 32 as recommended in the MDOT's 2018 Pell study and for Maryland 26 prioritizing connectivity along Maryland 26 to address local access needs without further burdening the arterial and that's when we moved on to the um, five whoops, and PPIs that's it right mm -hmm okay these are in a different order this was what was provided in a previous presentation so these don't match up I don't believe exactly to what you have in the um, draft plan thank you the summary map is not currently in the um, in the draft that we gave that's really hard So we will be putting this map we, we like this map we have it for each of the sub areas I don't believe clear this is not included currently in the okay this we will be adding this because I think it's a good summary map um, and I'll just briefly go through what each of these are in a more detailed way so the first one is and this is important extending Georgetown Boulevard between London Town Boulevard and Progress Way this is in currently in our CIP um, let's see, do I have the year? No. Um, but this is in the CIP and is seen as as a very necessary connection. The second one is the consultant provided us with this. It's to implement the quadrant roadway concept from a previous Maryland 32 practical design study, and basically it's to eliminate that left turn on from 32 onto 26 obviously there'd be a lot to be worked out I mean I think they had this in the consultant study as something that could be implemented almost immediately I'm not exactly sure how implementation would would go forward with this and also you would obviously need to improve that part of Georgetown that it's um, taking it through and you'd have to address the businesses that are at Maryland 32 and 26 so this is something they threw out there as a possibility particularly of a low cost and it's basically a change in behavior of motorists um, 
the third one, and this this is a big one also, as Georgetown, they're probably the two most important planned major streets in the Freedom Area, is to construct Dickinson Road between Oklahoma Road and Georgetown Boulevard, and then manage the access to Maryland 26. And this goes towards the concept that we discussed a little bit before about um, keeping some of the traffic off 26 if it's if it doesn't need to be if it's if you could just use Dickinson it would be a good idea just to use Dickinson and we do already have parts of Dickinson constructed as you can see and I believe we have some of the right of way for this now um, so it may end up it doesn't need to be built in its entirety it could be piecemealed together eventually but this is seen as also very important um, Especially between Hemlock and um, uh, Walnut, um, either it is our, we have right of way, um, there's an easement, or um, as a development would come forward, they would be able to that. So that portion could be easily constructed. Where would it come behind um, from Walnut to Georgetown? <coughs> I, I can't. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. So would it go through the shopping center? Well, I mean, yeah, it would have to, there would have to be some type of engineering done, but yes. Right. Okay. And like, so if the shopping center were to completely redevelop, that would be an opportunity to change traffic patterns within that parking lot and things like that. And again, this may not be the entirety, of doing the entirety of it, but just doing any little bit of this we do would help. Okay. Um, and then the last one is to construct <clears throat> strategic operational improvements along Maryland 32 between the Howard County line as outlined, Howard County line and, and 26, <coughs> as outlined in the t 2018 Maryland 32 um, health planning study. And this isn't a detailed map of this, but it's just showing where on 32 the most promising potential improvement would be this was currently we learned just several weeks ago going to be included in the FY 2328 um, state consolidated transportation program this was in the commissioners I believe is the second priority the commissioners um, priority letter to the secretary um, last spring and this was the number one breakout project which is second street to main street to improve intersection geometry extend turn lanes modify access and evaluate signal warrants at um, Main Street. So it's basically what's included in the MPPIs and then regarding the um, benefits and impacts you can see the map here that shows if you made these um, improvements, what things would look like. You can see that you still have problems on the eastern end um, of Maryland 26. You've improved from being level of service F in both directions, Maryland 32 and um, 26, and I think a slight improvement to the Freedom Avenue situation as well. Most of the changes that you'll see, most of the improvements are right around the Georgetown um, Boulevard and um, right around where Dickinson it would be constructed so um, that is it for Eldersburg we could move on to Finksburg unless there's any discussion right now I just have one question as they've looked at this data um, when were they collecting data because COVID has messed up so many yes things and it was all pre-COVID they, they delivered this to you I guess just two of you yeah. Um, summer of 2020 they brought their results but the data was all collected before that yeah, obviously a year, before that. a year before that and some of it was even before that because they used the data from the Pell study that was completed in 2018 and the Maryland 26 corridor study which was also before 2020 
So they, they didn't use terribly old data, but some of it was definitely before 2020, the data that they used. And it was from different sources, so it's a little hard to answer that question yeah. um, specifically. But no, it, it does not have any COVID. Um, yeah. I know BMC is, is looking now at what COVID has done to the numbers, and we'll be getting that data probably pretty mm -hmm. soon. Well, my, you know, life experience has been that obviously during the lockdowns there was very little traffic and so we didn't need this um, right. but then now I think people work differently and they travel differently and you know they're working Tuesday Wednesday Thursday in the office they're not working Mondays and Fridays or they're you know who knows but um, it just seems like it would be I'm not sure it's knowable but it would be nice to know how people are traveling now in making decisions around these things and I guess that's just not possible and I think it's going to keep changing because I don't know how people what does work look like is a question I keep asking well I think what I we know. could do is we obviously all the data went into this analysis so we couldn't redo this analysis but as we work through this it's possible we could get some of that data from BMC as as they've been collecting it even as a separate chapter chapter of a post-COVID world that kind of thing and if it's terribly different, then you'd have to look a little bit differently at, at this analysis or at, at these conclusions. I was talking to the consultant the other day, and I asked him that question, and he said what they're finding in some of the studies they're doing for other jurisdictions is that the traffic is still all out there. It's just stretched out. Um, they're not seeing a whole lot fewer cars on the road. And, you know, he didn't give me any data on it. He didn't give me it, but that was sort of his his thought on it when I asked, and he said, no, you don't see it quite as much focused on the actual peak hour, but it is, so people are still leaving their houses, I guess is what he was telling me. Yeah, but the timing, I think, matters, the because if matter. you're, you know, a lot of these problems are during peak hours. Once you get outside the peak hours, the intersections are typically not as big of a problem or Absolutely. not a problem at all. Right. And if the idea is that now people aren't traveling so much at peak hours and they have flexibility to work around that, some of it is being solved through that mechanism and maybe my guess would be that some of these problems may be less of a problem now it doesn't mean we don't want to problem solve but maybe it just means it's not as bad in the short term or I don't know maybe it means something else yeah I see the Georgetown 26 becoming a bigger problem because you're gonna have Georgetown extended mm -hmm. that's gonna bring traffic so if they eliminate that left turn on 26 and it's all going to it'll kill that shopping center, the doctor's offices. Mm -hmm. It's already a struggle to get out yeah. on some times there. So, I think they need to investigate that a little further. And again, these were just ideas given by the consultant. Obviously, they don't make policy, so mm -hmm. that would be maybe when we finish all six quarters, we could come back. And if there's any that you don't want included in the plan to for us to be sending to the commissioners eventually. Um, it's going to be taken out. I mean, these. This chapter doesn't have to mirror the consultant study. It was used as the basis, and you'll be recommending to the commissioners. So, it's something to note. Okay. I'm going to turn it over to Claire now for Finksburg. Hi. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I, no, I, I would like to add that the, there are three exits off of I-70 that allow us to to come up into Carroll County, 97, 32, and Meritsville Road. The fact that we're ignoring Meritsville Road and Ridge Ridge Road, I, I'll, I'll, I've officed in downtown Baltimore, 100 and the corner of Pratt and Light. I never took 26 into town. I never took, you know, went through Owings Mills. I always went Meritsville Road to 70 because I had options. I could go 40 if there was a problem. You know, that not, Pete Luster needs therapy over his commuting, <laughs> you know, issues, but. You know, and, and then when my office, I moved my office from downtown to, to Columbia, I still took Meritsville Road. And I'm not the only one on that road. And so the fact that we're ignoring, and, and, and if there's an issue on I-70, people are getting off on Meritsville Road and avoiding, you know, because why would I sit and sit and wait to get to 32 or 97? I'll just take Meritsville Road. I'm telling you, there's a lot more traffic than I think anyone outside the area. If you don't live in the area, you, don't, you wouldn't think it. Because it's a it's a little podunk road. Why would anybody take this road? I'm telling. There's a lot of traffic on there that we're not picking up, and to ignore it on a study like this, 
I think we're 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 it's 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 not the elephant in the room, but it's the muskox. I mean, it's a big it's a big it's a big thing. I think we need to be at least looking at the data in terms of exit, who's exiting at these exits, and where's that traffic you know going? Is it going south to the you know, we could we can tell how many cars are on I-70 at, at Mearsville Road. We can tell how many are on there at, at 32, and who's getting off. I think that would be really helpful for us to understand that because so, somebody's got to have that data. Yeah. So we do have um, the state does have data on that. Those are actually state roads, Marysville one and two, mm -hmm. um, and they do provide ADTs for that. Um, I think, I, and I hear your point exactly, but I think by the time it gets to Carroll, I'm not saying we don't have traffic, but it really does dissipate. Um, from the Howard County portion up into Carroll County. We're happy to look at it again. I would just say no one ignored it. It just wasn't um, the ADTs and some other triggers weren't there um, to bring it to that level where it was of concern. Okay. But something we can certainly go back and explore. Yeah, because there's more traffic there than I think we think uh, or other people think. I'm sorry, moving on. No, that's a good point. Mary, thank you. So we are looking at the Finksburg sub area, um, starting on, I believe it's page six of your 11 by 17 document. Um, so I'm gonna follow the same format that Mary followed, um, starting with the road network. So those who are familiar with Finksburg um, know that 140 and 91 are the two major roads um, in that sub area, um, or I should say in the growth area. Um, so 140 is the principal arterial for the full length of the sub area. And it provides access east to Baltimore County and Racerstown, and then west to Westminster and beyond into Frederick. Um, and 91 intersects with 140. It provides access south to Sykesville and north um, to Baltimore County in the Upper Co area. So under land use and demographics, um, the low overall growth rate is anticipated in the Finksburg area over the next 20 years. That's for <coughs> residential and commercial. Um, for commuter flows in your right-hand column, um, Finksburg residents commute into Westminster, um, and that's 14%, 27% into Baltimore County, 10% into Howard County, and 9% into Baltimore City. And then for incoming um, commuter flows, 12% uh, commute within the sub area, 18 into Westminster, or from Westminster, and 15% from Baltimore County. So that means that Finksburg residents um, and commuter flows are using 140 east in the AM and west in the PM, and 91 south in the AM and north in the PM. So moving on to page seven. Our local goals and policies. We have a long held land use policy that limits growth in Finksburg. Um, and for tra uh, existing traffic con uh, conditions, as Mary said, this the consultant did not look at crash data, but we know there is um, a high, high rate of crashes at the 140 and 91 intersection. Um, and it, we experience congestion throughout the day, um, uh, especially near the end of the AM peak hour. Uh, travel speeds along 140 are 50 miles per hour both ways, um, and during both peak hours, um, they remain above 45 miles per hour. And for 91, um, it's 55 miles per hour both ways, and it remains above 35 miles per hour during both peak hours. Moving on to page eight. So um, planned residential and economic growth in points north and west 
of Finksburg, so Westminster, Tawnytown, um, Southern Pennsylvania, will contribute to continued traffic congestion um, along 140 um, through 2040. So our recommended approach um, uh, for, to address Finksburg's transportation concerns um, is to stay the course managing growth in the area, acknowledge that development farther north, as I just said, in Westminster um, and Tawnytown will um, continue to, str <coughs> to strain the local transportation network, and therefore improvements in the area will um, be made exclusively by the county and SHA. Um, and the pro this approach will conform to the um, county's master plan. Um, additionally, county and MDOT SHA should continue to pursue access management strategies along 140 through the sub area. And the county should pursue strategic roadway connections that will allow for access to and from 140 um, while minimizing impacts on the arterial roadway. So we're going to switch over to the other document, um, similar to what Mary had, um, and these, this is going to show the, the four most promising potential improvements, or MPPIs. Um, yeah. Okay. So the image on the first page might look a little off. That's because we're not. Um, north is a little, you might have to turn your map. Um, but we're going to start from, from the top and um, end at the bottom where number four is. Um, so uh, recommendation number one is to construct a jug handle design at 140 and 91 intersection. Um, that's actually being designed right now by SHA staff. Um, and this will eliminate the left turn lane on 140 westbound. Um, and if you're familiar with that intersection, you'll know that the um, left turn lane on 140 eastbound is already eliminated. You kind of have to go up into that shopping center, not quite into the shopping center, and then come around on um, 91 northbound and cross the intersection. So it's kind of the same concept there. Moving on to the second recommendation. This is um, a median from Baltimore County line to um, the 91 intersection with a single break at DD Road. Um, it will eliminate uh, mid-block left turns by removing the exister, existing center turn lane um, and, and the turn lanes at Cedarhurst and Old Gamber Road. Um, so all turn lanes will be consolidated to 91 and the, um, the current light that's at DD Road right now. So north and south movements across Cedarhurst and Old Gamber um, will not be permitted. And that's, if you can see my cursor, that's this right here. So left turn lanes at um, 91-140 intersection. And then down here at DD Road, which might not make sense quite yet, but we're getting there. So recommendation number three is to extend DD Road access um, across 140 and connect it to Old Westminster Pike. Um, that will provide access from westbound 140 to Old Westminster Pike um, once the median and access closures are constructed. Um, as well as provide local access between the Walnut Park Industrial Walnut Park Industrial Park, and then the designations along Old Westminster Pike. And then the last recommendation, or MPPI, I should say, um, is to convert the intersection of Old Westminster Pike and 140 to a right-in, right-out. Um, access only um, because from recommendation number two that median would run um, across that intersection so right in from eastbound 140 and then right out one to eastbound 140 that's it for the MPPIs I'm going to switch back over 
we're going to move on to the last page, page nine. And so the benefits and impacts, um, constructing a median and extending DD Road will shift local traffic from 140 and will allocate more capacity along the 140 corridor to the through vehicles and um, reduce delays caused by the left turning vehicles. Constructing the jug handle will eliminate left turns off of 140 in both directions, um, allowing east to west traffic um, to move through with more signal time um, and it will provide operations for the eastbound approach during both peak hours um, and for the westbound approach during the a.m. peak hour. Um, and you'll note that uh, this map on the right hand side of the screen is the 2040 traffic conditions with all of the MPPIs. Um, 91 you'll see um, in the a.m. and some of the p.m. peak hours, um, the level of service does worsen a little bit, but um, that will, it will, in reality, help the through traffic on 140 get through that intersection. And 91 um, does not see the same amount of um, traffic volume as 140 does. Um, and I think that's it. Did I miss anything? <coughs> Do you guys have any questions on the Finksburg area? I, I do. Sure. Um, so if you're coming westbound up 140 and the new DD road, you can go left onto that over to Old Westminster Pike. Is that you'll be able to make that right? Yeah. Turn. So the MPPIs call for a break in the medium median at 91 and DD Road. Okay. So anybody c continuing up to 91 then comes up and goes that little thing shortcut and comes out onto 91 below where food lion is down a block or two mm -hmm. and that is where we see a ton of accidents because traffic's coming this way this way people try to pull out um, last week when there were two bad accidents on 140 just below Baltimore <laughs> County line um, we couldn't get down that way and we initially went down Old Westminster Pike only to be funneled back up to 91 on the other side but we saw two accidents right there at that spot just because people so would they be considering a traffic light there on that I mean it would seem crazy because there's one at 140, but it's a dangerous spot. This is a traffic light at DD. Is that what you're asking? No, no. Oh, on 91, because um, Old Westminster Pike comes up, mm -hmm. and you could go right, but if you're going to have a median strip, you can't go back up 140. So the only other way would be to go down. And people always use that as a shortcut to go across 91 to 32. Mm -hmm. And accidents are very prevalent there. So, so Gamber Road? Yeah, uh, yeah, well, it's 91, but yeah, right. yeah, right, yep, right there. It's, it's a big over right here. I can't see, can you make it bigger? So there's 140. This is Old Danbury. Right yeah. Here. So right. It extends DD. Right where they come out from Old Danbury. Mm -hmm. More people come Yeah. So because there's here. traffic coming here, yeah. going this yeah. way, yeah. and it's 50 miles an hour there, so yeah. they're speeding. It's. I just see that becoming more traffic on that and that left hand turn onto 91. Well, the left hand. Yeah, because people use it now to, you know, avoid yeah. getting up there. And I would say when they extend DD, it's going to... Right, make more. Guys aren't going to turn right on 140 to go up and do a jug handle to go down 91. They'll go straight across. And yeah, yep. Up there there. On that side. So mm -hmm. That'd be a problem to address. Yeah. It's, 
If you if you extend D D to oh, Westminster, oh, Westminster Pike. Pike, you're saying more people will flood in and then make that left on ninety one up here. Yep. Yeah. So if you make right now they're making the right and then they're they're going on up here. Yeah, right now they're they're coming way down below and coming up. But if you're gonna be eliminating a left turn at ninety one and one forty because a lot of people use that. Um but you know, it it's it's a bad spot. You know, I'm one that will go around Robin Hood's barn to get to where I'm going, but <laughs> not everybody likes that. <laughs> so, just a question for me: when when these guys are when these consultants are working, and I know how BMC works as well, a lot of the the problems that we see or challenges that we see in Carroll are as a result of the Baltimore County side. <laughs> Uh, Glen Falls intersection is is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. it always has been, and I don't know what could be done with uh, the American Legion and the um, the other restaurant there. But do do the consultants work or 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 ask or are they working with Baltimore County on that side as well with the SHA's blessings there? Well, they didn't work with them, but they did have the data that showed the, what the through traffic was and how okay. that, especially with this particular, with 140, that is the problem. That's it's not, we're not generating these problems. Same with when we get to um, Manchester. Yeah. Right. We see that Pennsylvania's mm -hmm. generating all their problems. Exactly. Yeah. So okay. they're yeah. aware of it and they factor it in, but. Okay. Yeah, because. Yeah, my, my point is, I, you know, we, we can, we can spend all the money here and it's not I'll never see it probably I don't know if the next board will see it uh, these these improvements but um, you know we spend a lot of money we'll have the potential to spend some money here with SHA because they they hinted the other day that we'll do all these projects if you help us out uh, you know if we if we contribute so I don't want to be I don't want Carol to take the the, the brunt of all that if there can be things that can be improved on either side of the of the um, county line. the county line, mm -hmm. and that goes that that you're right, Mary. That pertains to the Manchester area too. Um, I'll never forget when I first got in office in 2014. I had a lady ask what would be the ability of putting a toll booth, and <laughs> I, I just kind of looked at her and went, "I'm sorry, what?" But you know, people have that line of thinking like they're the ones that are causing the problem. Why are we paying for it? So I just hope these consultants work with, I know BMC does, I'm very aware of how they do it, but keep that in mind that sometimes we're not the responsible party here. It occurs a mile down the road and maybe they should do something a mile down the road to help us a mile up the road. So yeah. that's all. Glen Falls was, um, I mean, I would say on the average, and it's Baltimore County, but 140 shut down at least maybe once a month because of accidents there. It's just. A lot of that's because of that restaurant. Yeah, well. Because people try to get out of there and the average speed coming down the hill is 90. I don't oh, know, that's yeah. over exaggerated. It's close. <laughs> it's, it's, gravity, it's gravity assist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, when you're coming down that hill yeah. and you know you somebody says, up. well, I can make it if you're, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, no, you can't. Yeah. So. <laughs> So it, it's tough, and there's no deacceleration yeah. uh, on that side. No. It's only on the other side. The Moose Lodge is on the other side, and that's fine. But coming east yeah. or westbound, it's not. There's just no. So uh, you know, widening there would really help, or whatever. So that that's my only point to make sure that when we're going through these studies, to just mention, hey, you know. Some of the problems are occurring over there. Just let you know. You know. So. Well, and you know, we've we've got that program in Fingersburg where you can apply for assistance in um, in improving the exterior mm -hmm. of, of your building. I hope too, when we make these improvements to the road, that we'll consider doing something from a landscaping standpoint because it is the the first impression you get on our county, and once you get in our county, it's pretty. But there's a stretch there that's pretty tough. 
um, visually, uh, you know, and if that, that's your first impression of our county. And so as we make these improvements, if there's a, you know, landscaping and transportation really don't mix, right? You, we, we don't want trees falling on our roads at the same time. It, it would be nice to, to have something that softens that area. Um, and I, I, I wish Mr. Kane was here to kind of chime in on that because I know that area, it's a concern for that area. They would like it to have a, a facelift. It, that that's, has nothing to do with transportation other than while we're moving dirt and expanding roads and putting in inter intersections, it would be nice to do something to kind of soften it landscaping wise if we can. Yeah, it's, I mean, they would need an incentive to do it because yep. Yep. you're talking about property rights. That's right. So, yep. The one other thing um, is confusion. You know, if we put these jug handles in and cut things across, even the jug handle that's there now, I can't tell you how many times I've missed that stupid turn. You know, just, <laughs> and then I end up driving down the highway and doing a U-turn and going back. And um, because it's not intuitive, if, uh, you know, when I was you're first going right to turn left. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And. Um, and it's not the safest left when you get there. Exactly. You get down, I feel like, why am I being funneled into the shopping center? And then, then I come out to a stop sign, and then I've got these cars backed up, and I'm trying to get in and make a left turn. So mm -hmm. it, um, I guess it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not intuitive. Um, maybe it's the best alternative that's available. But um, then if we repeat that by putting another jug handle in, I think we need to very much improve signage and things like that, giving people lots of notice ahead of time that, you know, if you're going to, because I feel like when I'm coming down that hill, all of a sudden I'm ready to turn and there, there's the sign saying I needed to go into the uh, shopping center to turn left. Um, so I just think there are other just sort of day-to-day -day improvements for people that live there. That's not really a problem. They know all of that. But I think, and particularly with DD Road, people are going to get funneled down through old West, West, Westminster Pike and then onto Old Gamber Road, and then they're going to come out onto 91. And if those streets aren't set up to be handling traffic getting funneled off of 140, um, we're just going to create new problems there. And for folks that live in that area, they're really going to despise that, I think, because they're the ones running around on Old Gamber Road and Old Westminster Pike, and all of a sudden you've got half of 140 diverted through through there. So I'm just asking. I think we want to be thoughtful and deliberate about that, um, not have unintended consequences that maybe make things worse. And the last thing I'll say is I know we've had a lot of people come in here when we're doing the master plan and other things, and traffic is something people are very passionate about um, because we live it, all of us, every day and get frustrated and say, is this really the best we can do? Um, and uh, it'd be nice if this is really the best we can do, not sort of I, – I get the point about we can't do big projects. We have to kind of do these things in the interim. But sometimes doing things in the interim, it always feels like a work in progress, and so it's always subpar, and we all just kind of live with it and deal with it, and we never quite get across the finish line during our lifetimes. And um, maybe these little projects can be combined so at least it all works pretty well so that as a driver we're sitting there saying, is this the best we can do? So I think there's this constant struggle, too, between um, traffic flow um, and um, the, the businesses along that corridor and, and safety and conveyance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so back years and years and years ago, 140, that stretch between the county line and 91 was supposed to have a median, was supposed to have limited left turn movements uh, for safety reasons. So it would also help with the flow going um, northwest and southeast bound. You wouldn't have those potential head on, you know, that, that suicide lane in the middle, for lack of a better term, which is very dangerous. But the businesses didn't want that. That was a big tug of war because the businesses wanted anyone to have a free moving left hand turn into that. Okay, well, then that creates. Um, you know, there's conflicts with the, the turning movements. Um, and then at 91, again, a long time ago, there was to have a continual flow interchange so you would have like an overpass and an underpass. So there would have, there would be no light. You would not have that. Um, and then just plans have changed. Things have gotten really expensive. Um, so a lot of it has to do with funding. And one of the things that we heard from MDOT too is, you know, just like everyone, no money for new stuff. We're just trying to maintain what we have. So I think this is the best we have given the situation and, and that these are 
Yes, they're in Carroll County, but they're not county roads. Yes, we work with MDOT, but there's only so much that we can do. So that's what we're really trying to balance um, with all of this. So the new, the federal infrastructure plan that passed with $10 zillion in it, doesn't any of that trickle to the state of Maryland? I mean, it seems like oh, if yeah. there's ever a yeah, time and there's a lot of projects happening because big projects, of that. Yeah. That now would be the time. I mean, there should be like tons of money in Shovel that. Shovel ready. Line. Yeah, I mean, politically, this seems to be something that's been funded. Yeah, the 32, a lot of the projects we have are going toward that, but just not not this one. So a lot of things are getting funded, and I'm sure Commissioner Wayans can speak more directly as to where that money is going, but there is, um, you know, there is a lot coming back to the county. Because overpasses seem to be the obvious answer at 91 and 140. You put Mm -hmm. overpasses in, you get rid of jug handles and and all that stuff. Um, and that happens in a lot of places. And I get the tension. If you look at Route 50 down near the Bay Bridge, when they put those, they closed off the side roads and traffic flow increased wonderfully and it put all kinds of businesses out of business because you couldn't get to them right. unless you drove about 12 miles around and nobody was going to do that. Um, but I don't know. It's just a question for, it just seemed, I get the funding is always, ever since I've been on this commission, yeah. and we've had MDOT people come in and say, stop asking for big projects because they're never going to get approved, only ask for little projects. And I get that, but long term, that's not really sustainable. Sometime you have to do a big project. Yeah, it seems absolutely. To me. And don't see them yet. In the last year, politically, we've seen lots of money thrown at this big infrastructure stuff. It would seem like if there's ever a time that this could be done, now would be the time. And the answer that we're still hearing is, uh, no, just keep asking for little projects and don't even think about an overpass. Just do a jug handle through a through a shopping center, and you'll be fine. Um, not really, not the best we can do, I don't think. Um, it seems like we could do better. I live in Gamber and have always loved the ability to go 32, 91, mm-hmm. 140 into bottom or, or straight down 32. Um, and I find myself probably going 32 more so I don't have to deal with 140. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, 140 is a big issue. For sure. Well, we'll solve nothing here today. <laughs> but, um, it's a good conversation. Yeah, it's yeah, cathartic. It anyway. I feel better. <laughs> uh, my therapist will be happy. That's right. That's right. Um, that's right. Anyway, you, but I'm not. I don't mean to denigrate your good work. This is really. Yeah. No, important. it's good stuff. And, yeah, it is good stuff. And it certainly takes us in the right direction. Um, well, and I will point out, Chapter Six does have those ultimate improvements. Okay. In them. That's the plan, Major Streets, that has all what's in the HNI, the Highway Needs Inventory for the state. So you'll see all those. This was more of a realistic look. What we can do. Yeah, we do unconstrained. I mean, highway needs inventory is unconstrained. So there's no budget rails to, to keep you on. So what would you ultimately need to have, like, the best roadway system? But then, unfortunately, like you said, then it starts funneling down to federal money, state money, local money. And, and then that unconstrained project becomes more and more tight. And so that's why we're trying to at least do what we can um, and we've made a lot of progress over the years with our transportation infrastructure in the county so and the other thing is we've compared to who we compete against yes. for these big projects like there's a Maryland uh, Baltimore region congestion map we're a blip on it I yeah. think parts of 140 maybe this 91 140 yeah. might be on it and I think there's one other by Westminster nothing else no part of 32 or anything is showing up on that congestion map. There's just these dots everywhere else, and then Carol has these two. So that's who we're competing with. Yeah, and that's where a lot of the federal money is going, like the big yeah. seven bridges exactly project. Exactly where it goes. On 70. I mean, those those types of big infrastructure <coughs> projects. So I think 695. Yep. Yeah, the Beltway's, no, uh, as you know, you, you all travel it. Yep. It's, it's a never-ending Ending project because once they get more lanes they, they need more lanes yeah so you know all that money goes into there um, they've they've spent a ton of money on repaving which is really expensive now so a lot of the money's going into there but these big 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 projects that's where the, 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 that's when the light comes on and they're like okay let's hit that one because there's just so much congestion down there yeah. we've no. got it but they don't you know it's like Oh, relative. Deal with it. Yeah. But down there, it's just, it's a mess. Yeah. Well, and the little projects and the big projects don't have to be mutually exclusive. One mm-hmm. they can build toward right. <clears throat> that. I get it. Yeah. Well, thank you for your presentation yeah. and thanks for your really good work on this. And we'll keep plugging away and look forward to seeing the next one. Um, so I think that concludes our item 12 transportation master plan.
Item 13 is general public comment. Anyone sure, want to make a general public comment? See none. We'll move on to item 14, which is the adjournment. Is there a motion that we adjourn? I move we adjourn. I second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Oh, maybe you'd want to stay, Pete. That took a while. <laughs> yeah. We are adjourned. Thank you. Yes.